Good morning. My name is Pastor Chris Troxell. It's great to be with you. I'm the Associate Pastor of Christian Growth for a couple more weeks. And uh, it's a great, uh, great time to be here where God meets us with his word, just like he promised. Um, and we're talking today about this, I believe, uh, as God, as our creator, which is not always an easy thing to believe in. Um, so as we get into that, let's pray. Jesus, you are the word, the word that brought all things into existence, the word that holds all things together, the word that brings faith into our hearts. Jesus, help us to believe that word, to receive it all over again today, uh, that we can follow you, that we can believe in you because of your work in us. This we pray as we believe. Amen. All right, so talking about God as our creator, leading into that, I thought we'd talk about this. What is the last, when is the last time you quit something, right? When is the last time you quit something? A quitting generally seems to be like a bad thing, except when you quit bad things, right? How, how many of you have quit smoking at least once? All right, way to go, good job. Um, maybe you're back into it, maybe you're in the midst of quitting again, I don't know, wherever you're at, or maybe you quit once you were, you're, and you're done. And uh, you, you come to realize that um, even though smoking may uh, do something good for you initially in terms of feeling, um, over the long term, uh, your lungs are, tell you a different story, as well as your loved ones and your doctor. Um, they'll tell you that actually going through the struggle of quitting smoking leads to something much, much better. Um, in a similar way, how many of you have given up eating fast food? This is always less, like it's always less, like three people in every service. Um, I can't raise my hand for that either, right? Uh, because fast food is something to eat. It's technically FDA approved, right? And um, it fills your belly generally with something tasty. But again, over time, it does bad things to you, right? So quitting fast food is a struggle, but there's something better after you do that, or as you do that. So what does this have to do with God as our creator and believing in him as our creator? There are a lot of times it's just easier to quit believing in things you cannot see, especially when so much of what we can see has different explanations that seem to make a lot of sense until you read God's word. So it's hard. And it's easier sometimes just with doubts in general. Doubts give you, can kind of give you that confidence like nobody's going to fool me. I'm not going to be gullible. Nobody's going to pull the wool over my eyes. I'll be able to see through, you know, whatever's fake out there. So, so doubts in that sense can be comforting. So why should you quit your doubts? And how can we believe what we believe, teach, and confess about God. And see, here's the thing. Everyone believes something. Everyone believes something. Even if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in any religion, you don't believe in anything else, you believe that because you tend to trust your own logic and sense of things and how perhaps others around you share that perspective. And so you, put it, you are putting your belief in human logic. Generally, people who do that either don't know history well or only view it through a very particular lens and say, because we know we've learned all this stuff from the past, we know so much more better now. Yeah, even though I just used the phrase more better in a sentence and John Lucas is cringing as I'm preaching. <clears throat> And here's why everyone believes something about creation, right? We, and all we have here is belief because we weren't there. So quick, a little informal survey. It'll, it'll be fun, I promise. Everyone raise your hand. 
all right? And some of you have been a part of Trinity for years. Some of you, maybe today is your first day. Some of you, you've been coming to Trinity for a long time or maybe a short time, but you're not, you haven't made that commitment as a part of Trinity just yet. This is not a, a, a commentary on that, all right? But how many of you have, have belonged, uh, committed to be a part of Trinity for less than a year? All right, if that's not you, it's okay to put your hands down. You always belong here, no problem, all right? Um, how many of you have uh, made that commitment to Trinity for two years? Okay. Five years. Ten years. See, I got to put my hand down. I haven't been here that long. Right? Uh, 20 years. 30 years. 40 years. 50 years. All right, this has been at every service 60 years. All right, Tim Siegman, you haven't been here 60 years. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, anybody more than 60 years? More than 60 years. I'm at 70 years? All right, so a little over 60 years. Somebody at every service, every single one over Saturday, 8 o'clock, 9.15. 9.30 and 11, which means God has shown his faithfulness to generations of people here. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And I hope you don't take offense to this next question. Were you there when God made the world? <laughs> Tim? <laughs> no, we weren't there. And even people who claim different theories and different understandings come to different conclusions about what happened at the beginning, guess what? They weren't there either. They're making best guesses based on their interpretation of what they see. And I wonder if certainly everyone in the world would be great if we could do that, but it, maybe at least as God's people here or as someone who's considering where God is in all of this, we can have a perspective of humility and just say, and I don't know what happened there, I wasn't there. We weren't there. So what do we have to go on? We have the evidence of what, uh, what we see, what we experience, what we know, the scientific tools, what, and that word for science just means knowledge, okay? How we're using our knowledge to understand what's around us, right, that's a good thing. And than God's word. And sometimes conclusions we come to with our knowledge and tools don't line up with what God reveals to us in his word. So what do we do with that? Especially when sometimes when you, you, you put your faith in God, but he doesn't answer your prayers the way you want or in the time you want, sometimes that leads you through heartache. And sometimes it's easier to believe in what you see, what you can wrap your mind around, than something that to you seems inconsistent. And so for people who cannot allow for God's existence, they need another explanation. They need to understand what's around them differently than how God explains it, how God reveals it especially when God doesn't reveal everything, right? He only reveals what we need to know, what we can handle. And sometimes there are those of us who believe in God, but we need him to obey our logic, right? He needs to fit into these parameters that frankly he created. And so for those who, under, who need God to obey human logic, they need an explanation different than what God says in his word. And for, for those who have the faith, God speaks and reveals what you need to know in order to live. Not what you want to know, but what you need to know to believe and to live by faith. We see this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 where the writer of Hebrews talks about faith. Fun fact, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. <laughs> We've got some good, educated, scholarly guesses, but we don't really know. And yet the book is included. 
because it lines up with everything that God teaches in his word. And the people who were gathering scriptures together at the time saw this as having the same authority as other things that are included in God's word. So even though we don't know the author, we do trust what's written. And they write this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Read that with me or say that if you know it already. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. That sounds like crazy talk, right? Why would you have assurance from things you only hope for? And how in the world could you ever have conviction from something you don't see? That's, that's the way our mind is formed right now in education, in, in culture, in a lot of different ways. If I don't see it, I can't believe it, right? And yet even in human logic, in human terms, that breaks down as you begin to learn more about how we reason and understand things. So it's not by logic that we hope for. It's not by uh, logic or what makes sense to me that I, I have belief, a strong conviction in what's not seen. It's by faith. Verse 2. For by it, by faith, the people of old, all right, so you think about whoever wrote Hebrews, he was writing to people who were living in the New Testament time, that first century AD, right? So they were writing about who we refer to as people in the Old Testament. So for by it, by faith, the people of the Old Testament, of old, received their commendation. Not by their logic, not by the choices they made, not by their good behavior or, or obedience, by faith. Faith is a gift. It's not something we do or choose. It's something God gives you. And so the same commendation those of old receive, you receive. You receive that same commendation because you have the faith. The faith that God gave them to believe in his promises. The faith God gives you to believe in his word. Verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. You know, somehow, sometimes God's word isn't clear. It's pretty clear here. Right? It wasn't just the world that was made or some portion of it or just a galaxy or two, the universe. And the Greek language could talk about planets and different things, but it, they use the word for universe here. The universe was made by what? The word of God. So that what is seen is not made of things that are visible. You think about that and then... This also starts to explain perhaps why things we evaluate with human tools, we evaluate things that are seen, but we don't have access to test out in the same way things that are not visible, right? What made the universe? The Word of God. Now when you speak, can you see your words? Oh, I can't. I'm talking a lot up here, right? I don't see my words. When God speaks, we cannot see his word, but we see creation. We see everything that he does command, respond to it. So when God speaks to you through his word right now this morning, you're responding with doubt or faith or some mixture of both. And here's what this really shows us. Shows us four things. Shows us that the creator never quits creating. The creator never quits creating. We read about God making the world in Genesis, 
We get a perspective on this in Exodus chapter 34. Now in Exodus 34, Moses has been meeting with God. God has brought his people out of slavery in Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land, but they're not there yet. And God, or Moses asks God a question. He says, God, show me your glory. How, how does God respond? He's like, mm, Moses, I don't think you can handle that. Here's what I can do. I'm going to put you on a cliff. You know, I'm going to uh, put my hand around you to guard you from my presence because it's, I'm really too dangerous for you to, to receive all of my glory full on. You, you can't handle it. But I'm, I'm going to do this so as I walk by, I'm going to move my hand a little bit, and whatever that looked like. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but however God did that, and he says, I'm going to move my hand a little bit so... As, I, as after I pass by, you can kind of peek out and see my back. Another fun fact about interpretation, some English interpretations take that word as backside of God. We're going to say back, just the back of God, just leave it at that. And so he, he gets to see Moses by God's grace and mercy, he gets to see a portion, just the back of God's glory. That's because God, and as, as God does this, as he's passing by Moses, he's preaching, he's proclaiming, he's saying, the Lord, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding, limitless, and faithful, consistent, the word there is steadfast, love. God's love never ends for Moses or for you. People of old or people now or the people that are coming after us. If God doesn't return. We see another perspective of God's love on this and how God holds his creation together in mercy and grace and love. Sometimes we think about the law of God and that holds everything together. How much more so his grace and his love for you. Like in Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 it says, Paul writes this to, to believers in this town. He says, Jesus is before all things and in him, all things hold together. Can we have that up there? Can we bring that Colossians 1 up, if you please? Thank you. Jesus is before all things, and in him, all, in him, all things hold together. That means his mercy, his grace, his love ties everything together, holds everything together. It's woven into everything that is everything that was, everything that will be, and the lives that God knits together, the people that God knits together, he weaves in his mercy and his grace and his love, which is great because we break stuff, right? We forget stuff. And when we break God's image, when we break his good creation, it doesn't cease to exist. It's broken, but it endures because of God's grace for you, for all his creation. The creator never quits creating. We're going to move on to the next point for the sake of time. The creator never quits speaking. So God speaks, and then he speaks again. Now, why does God have to repeat himself? It's written down, right? We can just read it again, right? So think about this. How many of you had to give somebody a reminder this morning already? All right. How many of you needed that reminder this morning already? Yeah. yeah. We forget. We forget things. We get distracted. We need God to remind us to say something and then say it again. Sometimes you need to say it something like there's a car coming. There's a car coming. Like you need to pay attention, Right for the sake of your own safety or the safety of someone else. And so God is calling our attention to something when he speaks and he speaks again. We have a, a slide up here. It's going to be hard to read from, from here. That's a, the, the font is really tiny. I, I apologize about that. But on the left side at the top, it says forming. God is forming in days one, two, and three of creation. And in those days, he makes light and darkness. Did you guys know that God made the darkness? That's something good, and God saw is good too. So God makes light and darkness day one. Day two, he makes water above and below the sky and the sea. And day three, he makes dry land and vegetation. So God is forming these things. 
Days one through three. Days four through six, he's filling. He's filling those things that he just formed, right? And days, day four, he fills uh, the light and the darkness with the sun and then the moon and the stars and the planets. In day five, he fills the water above and the water below with birds and everything else that fills the sky. And then with uh, fish and other sea creatures that fill the waters. On day six, he makes animals and insects and humans. What God forms, he fills. What God forms as something good, he fills with something good. So when God speaks, he speaks again. Because he's calling our attention to something important. The creator never stops creating. The creator never stops speaking. There's some other stuff I want to share with you, but I'm short on time. So we're going to keep, keep rolling. We're just going to keep rolling. Um, so the creator keep, keep, never quits creating. The creator never quits speaking. The, never, the creator never quits knowing. God knows you. He sees you. He sent Jesus to die for the world, not just the world at that time, but the world throughout time and space. The beginning of God, be, God beginning to restore all things starts with Jesus dying and rising. He defeats sin. He defeats death for you. If God knows how to provide for the world across time and space, and he could provide for sparrows moment to moment, God knows how to provide for you. All right, so I'm, I'm, I took a call to be a pastor down in Ann Arbor before gas prices started to rise. Yeah. I've got a big question for God, right? I'd like a lot of clarity on how we're going to be able to make that work. But I know God knows. He knew what was going to happen, and he knows what's going to happen when, when I start driving down there. Which leads us to our next point, our last point. The creator. The creator never quits. And it's so good in all the other services. I don't know why it's this one. Maybe it's the fourth time, fifth time I appreciate it. Maybe that's it. But God makes something good, and then he fills it with something good. God, had create, God created an opportunity for me and for you, for us together here six years ago. And he filled it with good things. Six years. Six years of life and love and struggle and faith and hope. God created another opportunity for me in Ann Arbor, which also means he's creating another opportunity for you here. And God is faithful. I'm just going to read this. <laughs> God is faithful. He is mercy. He is grace. He is love. And I believe God will fill these new opportunities with good things for all of us. Because I believe God, and I believe God because he gives me faith to believe, to follow. I believe he gives you that same faith. So when things get broken and lost, God redeems them. One day God will restore all things better than they ever were. As the band comes forward and we enter into a time of prayer, I want you to meditate on that truth. The creator never quits. And just because God is a creator doesn't mean that he's not also one who redeems. Pastor Justin mentioned this last week in his sermon, right? We don't just believe in God, we believe God in his word. Jesus says this in John chapter 8, verse 58. He says, I and the Father are one, the Creator and the Redeemer. And yes, even the Holy Spirit are one. So we can see through those words of John that God, it, we just get a bit of a perspective on the Trinity. The Father who creates, the Son who redeems, the Spirit that is present and comforts us. And so when things get broken and lost, God redeems them. And one day God will restore things better than they ever were. The creator never quits. 
Please pray with me. Jesus, thank you for being faithful, for continuing to show us the Father. God, create in me a clean heart. Remind me that because of you, I'm a new creation every day. And repeat your promises to me until you return. When I forget, forgive me. When I doubt, forgive me. When I want something other than you or in addition to you, remind me that you are all that I need. You never quit. Lord, help me to always believe. We pray this in your name. Amen.